Are you okay? Rachel yelled out as she ran towards me through the storm, trying not to laugh. It figures that moving day would find lightning, thunder, and rain attacking us from above, but it had been completely clear when we headed this way with a truckload of all our worldly possessions. I'm good, I called out, chuckling to myself as I lay on the ground with thick raindrops splashing me in the face. Honestly, I had no idea how I ended up there on the flat of my back. I volunteered to brave the storm to get the door to our new home unlocked. I planned to get the lights turned on too, as the sky had grown quite dark when the bottom fell out only minutes before we arrived. Rachel was five months pregnant, and I was hoping to make things as convenient as possible. Her back had been throbbing pretty bad lately, and this move was already taking its toll on her. The new house was massive. My wife and I decided it was time for us to move out of her apartment in the city and upgrade to a house in a more peaceful environment as soon as we found out we were expecting. We had only been married for a year, and it was a surprise to both of us when the test showed positive, but we had been talking a lot about trying to conceive in the near future. Sure, we had hoped to be a little more financially stable by the time we brought a new member into our little family, but I can't say we weren't excited about it. After looking at a handful of houses over the course of a few months, we instantly fell in love with this one. We had no doubt that there would be an ice cube's chance in the depths of Satan's asshole that we could afford it but we asked for more details regardless. The price we paid was a little higher than our budget, but it was a remarkable deal for the size of this place. Rachel and I made decent money between the two of us, but we couldn't have dreamt of owning a house like this, even with our combined income. Now, I've watched a considerable amount of mystery and horror movies in my life, so I made sure to do the research before we signed off on it. I'm sure we're all familiar with the surprisingly priced houses that just happened to have been the location of a brutal and bloody massacre. As it turned out, our new home had been built a few months ago, and we would be its first owners. No history, no tragedies, no skeletons in the closet. I even looked at the land it was built on. Nothing much to speak of there either. Given the storm raging outside, we decided to hold off on unloading anything until the weather cleared up. I called in a few favours to help us with the move, but they had headed out to grab some food before meeting us here. By the time our friends arrived, things had simmered down substantially outside, so we began the tedious and back-breaking process of unloading the truck. It took some time, but we had everything inside by ten. We were all pretty beat up by the time the whole ordeal was done with, so we decided to just crash for the night and worry about setting everything up the following day. We bid our friends goodnight, with a healthy amount of gratitude, and turned in for the night. It was probably about three in the morning when the knocking woke me up. It almost sounded like someone was jerking on the door handle, trying to get in. You hear that? I asked Rachel, before turning to see she was still in a deep sleep. I gently slid out of the bed and tried to make my way through the new and unfamiliar house in the dark. It took some groping around the walls to make my way downstairs, and I almost busted my ass a few times over our shoddily stacked boxes, but I finally arrived at the foot of the stairs. Our new home stood alone on about ten acres. There wasn't much life around, and the absence of any manner of streetlights found the vast living room hidden behind the shadows of the night. I stood on the ground floor landing, just listening for a few moments. Only silence. I shook my head before yawning wildly. I'm hearing things, I whispered to myself as I made my way back up to the bedroom. The next day was mostly taken up by arranging our furniture and pushing aside the boxes we would be storing between the loft and the basement. That would be the task for another day, as our priorities were in getting the house feeling like a home. After another few days, we were feeling pretty cosy, and it was time for the grueling process of packing away the non-essentials. As I was awkwardly carrying boxes up the ladder to store them in the attic, I found myself impressed by the size of the room. It appeared twice or even three times the size of the storage area in my parents' house. Having moved from an apartment, I didn't have much experience with rooms such as these. I couldn't speak to whether this was an unusual size for a loft, but I was not surprised given the size of the house itself. God damn it, 
I yelled out after tripping over an uneven floorboard with both arms gripped around the base of the boxes. You okay, babe? Rachel called out from the opening behind me. Yeah, nothing hurt but my dignity. I laughed while rolling to the side and gathering up the boxes that now lay splayed open on the floor. She was giggling pretty good when she caught sight of me after ascending the ladder to the room I now knelt in, gathering spilled memories of the floor. What did you trip over? Rachel asked, still chuckling. No idea, I replied, still reloading the boxes. Looks like a loose floorboard, she said, nudging the raised edge with her foot. After gathering myself back up from the floor, I took a look at the slight lip that had tripped me onto my ass. It looked like a long and wide, single sheet of plywood. The rest of the floor in this room was made up by 2 by 4s so the large chunk of thin wood seemed quite out of place. I climbed back down the ladder to the second floor below and took a long screwdriver out of my tool bag, which would be headed to the basement later that day. After returning to where my wife still crouched beside the unusual section of flooring, I jammed the flathead driver into the seam and pried up the sheet of wood. What the hell? Rachel said, looking down at the floor. Beats me, I shrugged, staring at the door that was recessed into the floor of the attic. We puzzled over the reasoning behind installing a second opening in the loft, outside of the one that had the fold-out ladder we had scaled in the first place. Though it was a far bigger room than I had expected to see when we climbed the steps, I couldn't understand why a second entryway would be provided, especially in the form of a wooden door that would normally stand upright. Upon closer inspection, and a quick jaunt back downstairs to compare, it could not be denied that this was the same style as the front door that led into our new home. Open it up, Rachel suggested while I just looked at it, scratching my head. Stand back then, I suggested. The last thing I wanted was for either of us to fall to the floor below, especially my very pregnant wife. The door had a regular knob with a deadbolt lock above it. I unlatched them both and pulled the door ajar. Huh? I said, looking at my wife, then back to the floor. What the hell is the point of that? Rachel replied, staring down at the wooden floorboards beneath the open door. It wasn't until I closed the strange door back up and began to slide the plywood back over it that I noticed the small text written on the top right corner of the door. For when they come. Sighing Booper, I read out loud, after leaning over to make out what they read. When... They come? Rachel asked. No clue, I replied, rubbing my chin. As we headed back to the actual attic door, I noticed another unusual aspect of this room. There was a thick metal bar attached to the brackets on the ceiling. It had a heavy looking chain hanging from it that was looped back around it with a hefty hook. On top of that, when I was descending the ladder to exit the storage space, there was a steel hoop protruding from the back side of the door that hung down behind the ladder currently. Safe room, maybe? Rachel suggested. Attic seems a strange place for a safe room, I chuckled. Shrugging off the chain and assuming the bizarre door to nowhere to be some kind of bizarre practical joke on the part of those who constructed the building, I went back to gathering up boxes for storage. On my second trip, I gave another glance to the oddly located door and slid the plywood back over it. I just nudged the screwdriver to the side for the time being and turned my attention back to the task at hand. My wife and I went on about the rest of our day of stashing things between the basement and the attic, but I could not shake the image of the storage store. My mind kept wandering back to it whenever I found myself sitting still for a moment. As we approached the end of our first week in our enormous five bedroom house, the majority of our settling in was over. Sure, we'd rearrange things here and there should we feel the urge, but our grueling and busy move was finally done with. Rachel and I had both taken two weeks off from our respective jobs, so we had plenty of time to enjoy some peace before we had to get back on any manner of a schedule. As much as I loved our new home, there was one aspect of living there that did trouble me. Ever since being here, I still occasionally found myself awakened by the same knocking sounds that jerked me awake on our first night. It wasn't every night, mind you, just here and there, but always around three in the morning. It could be that it would still occur every night, 
Maybe I was lucky enough to be in a deep enough sleep most nights to not be forced into waking up, but I was growing concerned about what could be causing it. The fourth time it pulled me from my sleep, I fully investigated the strange noises. I flipped on all the lights in the living room and even strolled around outside with a flashlight for 30 minutes or so. I still found nothing. No trees brushing up against the house, no signs of any wildlife that could be bumping off the exterior walls in the night. Nothing. It actually sounded like it was coming from inside the house as much as outside. It was almost as if it echoed from all around me, if that makes any sense. It wasn't until the tenth night that I finally got my answers to the shuddering and knocking sounds in the night. It was some time after midnight in the early morning of October 5th, 2018, when the events that almost broke my weary mind occurred. What was that? Rachel asked, sitting straight up in the bed beside me, shaking my arm. Huh? I replied, still half asleep. I think there's someone in the house, she said with a voice trembling. It's probably just the knocking I've been telling you about, I replied. She was of the opinion that I was overreacting to the noises that woke me in the middle of the night. I even tried to wake up the last time, like she asked me to. She'd assumed that I was just hearing things, but she asked me to let her know next time, and she'd come check it out with me. This isn't knocking, babe, Rachel said, wrapping her fingers around my arm. It wasn't until then that I looked at the time. It was only a little after two, and the knocking always happened closer to three. I sat up beside my wife, and we stayed still, trying to figure out anything going on beyond our bedroom door. Sure enough, I could lightly make out the sounds of multiple footsteps and whispering voices. Stay here, I told my wife as I crept out of the bed. No, she said, don't go out there. She sounded genuinely afraid. I'm sure it's nothing, I replied, tracing my fingers across the side of her face. You don't need to get worked up in your condition, I smiled and gave her a wink. Truthfully, I was pretty nervous about seeing what was going on out there. We don't own any type of weapons, but I hoped the umbrella I grabbed would be enough to get a good wallop on anyone who may be intruding. I slowly opened the door and leaned forward to see if I could make out anything. As soon as my head poked out of the door, I felt a tight grip around my neck and I was pulled out of my bedroom. Well, look at what we got here, the large man wearing a ski mask said. I tried to swing at him with the umbrella, but he just snatched it out of my grip with a hand that was not currently pinched around my throat. What the hell do you want? I squeaked through the tight grip. The man just smiled, and another came charging up the steps. The one who was holding me by the neck shoved me into the other man's arms, before pushing through my bedroom door. No! I screamed out, fighting tooth and nail against the thick arms holding me in place. Don't touch her! I yelled, flailing and kicking. I heard my wife scream from inside the bedroom, and I felt my heart racing and my face flush with terror. Moments later, the man came strolling out of the bedroom, holding Rachel by the hair with her arms gripped behind her back. She was cussing and kicking while she fought against the man who was easily twice her size. Let her go, I yelled, still struggling to get free. The two men stayed silent as they dragged us kicking and screaming down the steps before throwing us to our living room floor. I started to get back up onto my feet, until the one who had pulled me from the room pulled a gun on us. You're going to want to keep quiet, or I'm going to plug the both of you, he said with a smile peeking through his woolen mask. The other one was going through drawers, presumably looking for anything of value, while the one with the gun trained on us just kept waving the barrel from side to side. It never had a pregnant girl before, he said casually as he drifted the pistol from left to right between the two of us. You're pretty damn cute at that, he continued, glaring at my wife. Don't you even think about it, you piece of- I know you ain't trying to start nothing, bud, the man yelled out, interrupting my words. He strolled to where I was sitting. I tried to slide my body in front of Rachel before he crouched down to look me right in the eyes. Tell you what, big man, he said, forcing the barrel of the gun under my chin. How about you sit there and shut your goddamn mouth while I have a bit of fun with your lady? I began to shake at the thought of what he was planning to do. I had to do something. I know what you're thinking, bud, he said, burying the gun deeper. Give it a shot if you got the balls. 
His eyes grew large and wild as he stared me down. Before I knew it, my arms seemed to act independently from my mind as I smacked his gun away from me and my wife. A bullet fired into the staircase and I pushed the hulking man forward onto the floor. Rachel, run! I yelled out before the man could pick himself back up. Immediately, she got up and ran for the stairs as the man got back up and charged at me. Get her! He cried out to his partner, who quickly began running after my wife. I was pushed back to the ground before I had the chance to chase after him. The large man punched me in the face and I immediately felt my head begin to spin. The guy hit like a damn truck. He pounded on my face a few more times and my senses began to fade and my ears started ringing. I heard Rachel screaming as a pursuer dragged her back down the steps by her feet. Stop, I whimpered, barely holding onto consciousness. The man struck me one final time and I felt my body fall limp. I was still awake, but incredibly dazed. Now, I'll show you what you get for pulling that stunt. The man, who still wore my blood on his knuckles, spat as he pinned my wife to the floor. He started tearing out her clothes while my wife screamed out. No, I said, barely holding on. As Rachel screamed at the top of her lungs, I forced myself back up from the floor. Get off of her! I screamed as I charged out at the man. He turned just in time to see me swing at him as hard as I could. Jesus! His friend yelled out as I felt teeth shatter across my fist. The hit must have knocked the big guy out cold. He just dropped as the other guy came at me. I quickly ducked in anticipation of his attack and ran my shoulder into his midsection. He fell to the floor, clutching at his gut. I started pulling the man off of my wife as the nightly knocking and shuddering sounds began. What is that? Rachel asked as tears still streamed down her face. It doesn't matter, I replied finally freeing her of the dead weight of her attacker. I grabbed her by the hand and pulled her to her feet. The attic, she said, while the large man behind her began to cough himself back to awareness. Go! We both sprinted up the steps as fast as we could, while both men were still picking themselves back up off the ground. As soon as we reached the second floor, we ran towards the attic door, only feet ahead. I jumped up and grabbed at the handle for the opening and pulled it down, releasing the collapsing ladder. We were both rushing on pure adrenaline as the two came thundering up the steps towards us. Once Rachel was up the ladder, I started lifting myself up. Three shots fired from behind me while I climbed up the ladder as fast as I could. I cleared the opening and reached back down to pull the ladder up, along with the door. The man's gun blasted two more times before I sealed the entrance behind me. Before I could register anything else, I reached up for the hooked chain and latched it onto the loop on the back of the entry flap. As the adrenaline that had spiked began to fade, I suddenly realized I was in a significant degree of pain. I looked down to see my stomach and right leg oozing. Babe, my wife said in a weak and shaky voice. No, I screamed out, causing me to buckle from the pain in my gut. Rachel was laying on the floorboards, gripping at her chest as blood spewed between her fingers. I could hear the invaders pounding and pulling on the door while a loud knocking and shuddering was echoing from behind the plywood that lay across the floor some feet from us. Bullets fired off underneath me, but none seemed to be able to penetrate the floor we lay on. I yelled out in fear and anguish as the love of my life coughed out thick blood before falling silent beside me. I pounded my fists on the wooden floorboards, though the pain in my stomach threatened to push me past my breaking point. The yelling duo still fought to get in, and the shuddering below the plywood grew more aggressive. I lay my head on Rachel's still bleeding chest and wailed out against the pain in my gut and in my heart. For when they come, my wife said softly. I choked my head up and looked at her face. She was still alive, but only barely. Don't speak, I said as tears rolled freely down my face. The door, she whispered. I jumped to my feet and ran towards the shuddering sound. I grabbed the screwdriver that still lay off to the side. Once again, I pried up the plywood and slid it away from the opening. The door shook violently from the floor. I turned back to my wife and my heart sank when I gazed her closed her eyes. I saw no motion, no expanding or contracting of her lungs. I hung my head in sorrow for my wife, an unborn child who lay dead across from me. 
I reached my trembling hand out towards the shuddering doorknob that stood up from the door that faced me. I turned my hand and lifted the door open. There was not a row of 2x4 floorboards anymore that lay beyond the second exit on the attic floor. Heavy droplets of water pelted me as a storm appeared to rage from behind the open door. I became distracted from the strange sight when the entrance behind me was finally pulled open after the metal loop separated from the attic door. You're dead now, the large man yelled out as I heard him thundering up the ladder. Screw it, I said to myself before jumping down into the mysteries that lay beyond the door that lay open below me. As soon as my body cleared the opening, I felt gravity shift from below me to behind, and my back slammed hard onto the firm ground. I lay there, dazed for a moment, while the thick raindrops splashed onto my face, before the door slammed shut behind my head. Are you okay? I heard Rachel yell out as she ran towards me, trying not to laugh. It took some time for me to put together what happened that night, and how the bullet holes in my gut and leg were no longer present as I lay with my back on the wet concrete, dressed in the same clothes I wore on the day we arrived. My wife had a hard time believing my account of the events that had occurred, but all I cared about was that she was alive and in my arms again. I took her up to the attic and showed her the unusual door that still lay behind a long and wide piece of plywood. She still wasn't convinced about the story I told her, but she couldn't argue that this was a bizarre thing. It wasn't until time passed by and brought us back to the early morning of October 5th that she couldn't deny the tale I spun her after I picked myself up from the wet concrete had to be true. A few days back, I purchased a rifle and a pistol of my own to prepare for the events that I had already lived through once. I sat in the darkness staring out of the second floor window with a gun in one hand and my phone in the other. I wasn't entirely sure at which time our late night visitors would arrive, but I made damn sure I would see them coming this time. Rachel didn't take my prediction seriously, but she began to reconsider when we saw the headlights approaching from a distance. No way, when the lights cut off as the truck drew closer. I called the police as soon as I saw the vehicle approaching, and I carried my rifle to the top of the stairs and trained it on the front door. I wasn't exactly familiar with shooting, but I was ready to fire if the assholes crossed the threshold. The truck stayed parked out front for some time before I saw the internal light flick on as the vehicle's door swung open outside the wide living room window. As soon as our front door gave way and my heart began to race, I saw the flickering blue light strobing from the road. After a failed attempt to escape, the police had the sizable men in handcuffs. Once the two had been loaded up, the officers commended my quick reflexes in placing the 911 call before the two could break in. Both of the men who were planning a robbing and potentially killing us had quite the checkered past and a handful of warrants sworn out for them. Likely, they would not be causing any trouble for at least a good 15 to 20 years. After a few months, my wife gave birth to our beautiful daughter, Samantha. She quickly became the light of our lives and gave me more reasons to smile than I ever could have imagined. It was a little after her second birthday, only a few months ago, that she found a fondness for poking everything in sight, including Rachel and I, with her cute little pointer finger. With every single poke, she would say, Boop. One day, after she had successfully booped my wife in the nose around ten times in a row, Rachel, attempting to hold back laughter, said, Okay, that's enough, Booper. As the realisation of what she just called our daughter hit, we both looked at each other, lost for words. To this day, the door on the attic floor still shudders around three in the morning. Strangely, the sound that used to wake me up in the middle of the night only serves to make me sleep easier now. I can't predict what the future holds for my adorable baby girl. But, I have a feeling, her new nickname is going to stick. <laughs>